Welcome, everyone. Uh, so good to see you all. It's always so good to be here with you. And yeah, wow, it's just to see your smiling faces all over the world and to feel the prayer of our hearts that we're all joined together to walk through this together and come through into the light. And what a deep journey this is. And thank you all for uh, jumping down the rabbit hole with me. I feel almost like one of those, you know, when, when they jump out of a plane and we've all got our parachutes on together and we kind of all jump out of the window together and we, we float a bit and then we grab hands to hold hands. So we form a circle and then we're in a free fall. We're, <laughs> we're dropping, dropping down at a very fast rate of speed and we're just holding hands but we are smiling uh, while we're in the free fall. And that's what I think this is. So I know you all enjoyed that, uh, that beautiful session with Frances. She's here in the studio too. And, and really, I think this purpose is the only choice. Uh, weekend is really an answer to a call because I know a lot of you are going through very intense experiences and um, I was reading through the questions that are written in and um, watching messages come in on my uh, Facebook Messenger and things. And, and so, yeah, just in this particular morning, there seems to be a, a great cry, a call for help that is very, very strong. And, and I think this session will be very, very helpful to put everything in a context and, and understand the, we are going through this big wake up and this forgiveness is a very, very deep journey. So I, I'm so grateful that you're all joined together and we're all in this together. I would say in terms of purpose that sometimes we call it forgiveness or we can call it the atonement. We call it healing. We call it awakening. There's so many different words that are synonyms for purpose, but what we can talk about is what Francis was opening up with and really emphasizing last night is that the, your purpose is in the mind. And that's why it seems to take a while to find your calling, your function, your purpose, because this whole world, all of time and space and this whole cosmos and this entire world was made as a, de as a deflecting shield, as a, as a smoke screen, as a, as a veil, as a cover, so that you would not know your divine purpose uh, to wake up and remember your true identity as the living Christ. And so the veil is very thick, the fog is very thick, and sometimes I remind everyone that, that Jesus seemed to walk this earth 2,000 years ago and demonstrate the, the light of this unconditional love and this... Uh, this grace and this peace and this harmony of, of heaven and of the, our heavenly creator. And yet um, it seems to have been 2,000 years that have gone by just in order to even get a scripture like A Course in Miracles into the realm of time and space, reflected into this realm because the fog, the ego density is very, very thick. And so I know myself, I feel extremely grateful to have had a reflection like A Course in Miracles and, and helping me make contact with Jesus and that direct contact which really has been such an acceleration in, in opening up and really letting go of all the beliefs of the world and time and space, which is really what the unconscious mind was, was filled with. So I just wanted to, again, frame our morning a little bit in saying that uh, uh, Francis yesterday mentioned that Jesus had said, you're afraid of each other, you're afraid of yourself, you're afraid of each other, your brothers and sisters, you're afraid of me, Jesus said, and you're afraid of God. And, and also I'll add the Holy Spirit in there too. So, so the brothers and sisters and who you seem to be as a person in this world is, is extremely fearful. Um, Jesus, the demonstration of divine love that, that seemed to be a, a demonstration in the flesh, so to speak, uh, or just a witness of this 
eternal love of the Christ. Uh, you're afraid of, of Jesus, if, afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was given as an immediate answer when the separation, when the belief in separation seemed to happen. And so there's a terror of listening to the Holy Spirit and Francis started to get into that with, uh, with Daniela and, and a few of the questioners where there's a belief in sacrifice that somehow now in order to know God it seems like there's a belief that you have to sacrifice the life, the personhood, the world, uh, the memories and everything about this world that it seems to be seems to be life on earth and it seems to be so important and now it seems like the relinquishment or the letting go of that make-believe self or substitute reality or uh, basically substitute identity, it seems like the relinquishment of the substitute identity is extremely fearful and that's why there is such a huge resistance to listening to Jesus and the Holy Spirit because it's it's underlying there's this ego belief that's this underlying chatter well yeah what is it going to cost you you're going to you're going to pay some kind of price you're going to have to be penalized you you're going to have to be punished something there's this deep unconscious belief that it's going to cost something to remember God and remember the true identity and so when we talk about purpose being the only choice, we're talking about the answer. The, that purpose is the Holy Spirit's purpose. That purpose is the purpose Jesus shares, the purpose that Jesus demonstrates. That's, a, that's our wake-up purpose, which is forgiveness. And again, this is not forgiveness the way a lot of us were trained to think about forgiveness, because we were trained to think that we have to forgive people for what they did to us or what they didn't do to us that we wish they had done to us, forgiving the environment, forgiving authority figures, for, forgiving things that seem to happen in time and space. And Jesus is saying, no, that is not actually forgiveness. You're not, you're not forgiving what happened. You're having to learn to release what has never occurred. So again, it always helps to come back to remember that the ego is a projection. The ego projects a world of time and space and, and it projects images as part of its trick to keep the mind feeling guilty and, and afraid and terrified. And that is the dynamics of what's going on. So. In Corinthians, in the Bible, it says you're looking through a darkened glass. When you're looking at this world of images, you're really having a hallucination. You're having a nightmare. And the sneakiest thing about the nightmare is it seems to have some aspects that are good, that are enjoyable. And so it's a, it's a, like a, a double sneaky uh, nightmare because you don't always recognize it as a nightmare, as wholly a nightmare. If, if, if this was recognized as a complete nightmare, you would drop it like a hot potato. You would just say, I am not buying into this uh, anymore. This, this is just a total ridiculous nightmare and I will have none of it. But the ego is so clever that it makes aspects of the nightmare seem attractive. So you get attached to the attractive aspects of the nightmare and then you, you don't want to let go of those attractive aspects and then in the end it all comes down to, wait a minute, this is a death wish that's generating this whole time and space cosmos. All of these stories are being generated, projected from a death wish and I need to let go of the death wish in my mind. So this is a very different teaching than a lot of the philosophies and theologies and religions that we've grown up with because I mean I don't know about you I was raised in Christianity I was raised on the on the Bible in Bible school and I was raised on Genesis in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth 
And uh, it's taken me a while before Jesus has said, well, it's half right. <laughs> that uh, God did create the heavens. And he's not talking about the sky or the, the, the spheres. He's talking about eternal heaven, eternal love heaven. God is the creator of, of eternal love. Uh, God is the source of eternal love. But, but the ego projected the earth and all of the other planets and spheres and galaxies and so on and so forth. So, so in order to really see this, that if this cosmos is a projection of the ego, Jesus makes it very clear that the world was made in hate. Uh, if you had to find the motivation under the seeming projection or the making of this world, it's hatred. And also, Jesus does say in the workbook, the world was made as an attack upon God, a place where God can enter not. Those are very strong words, and he's just establishing that in case you still are trying to salvage some aspects of the world, maybe you want to forgive and release 98% of this world, and then just keep the good stuff, you know, off and, and say, oh, I'm going to hang on to some of the good stuff. It's not so bad. It's, it's actually pretty good. Just remember that the purpose that generated the world was hatred. And you're not destined for hatred. You are d destined for eternal love and happiness and joy and harmony and oneness. You know, that's, that's our destiny. When it comes to purpose, the temptation of the ego, and Francis alluded to this too, is to project out many, many different purposes. So the ego has many different purposes for the body, many purposes for the world. In fact, if you think of the trillions and trillions of images that are part of this linear time-space cosmos, that the ego has invented its own unique, different purpose for everything. What's the purpose of, of a rug, or of a light, of a fan? What's the purpose of a body? What's the purpose of a planet, or a moon? What's the purpose of a, pla of a house, or a river? Uh, everything, a toothbrush, a toothpick, toothpaste, whatever you want to call it, the, every one of those things has a little bit uniquely different purpose. You know, we would say that, you know, there's, there is slight differences to purpose for toothbrush, toothpaste, and toothpick. They may, they may all have tooth in them. Now let me throw tooth in there too. A tooth, toothbrush, toothpaste, toothpick. Now, all of you are following me, you've got you've got memories and you've got meanings that go into those four words that I've mentioned. And those four things actually share the same purpose. If I told you that those four things I just mentioned, tooth, toothbrush, toothpick, toothpaste, all share the same purpose, you might go, really? Tell me more about that, because to the world, to the ego, they seem like very different images and they seem like they have very, very different purposes. What do they have in common? Forgiveness. What does that mean? They're all illusions. What does that mean? They all are projections. Okay, what's that, what's that mean? Uh, they all don't have a source. Hmm. What does that mean? None of them were created by God. Ah. So, that's how they're, they're alike. And you can do this with all the things that you perceive in your life. That relationship you're having trouble with, or that neighbor you're having trouble with, that body that you're having trouble with, that seeming symptom or illness or sickness that you're having trouble with, those emotions that seem to be swirling around there during your daily experiences, those all have a common purpose too, forgiveness. In other words, 
When we talk about the purpose of forgiveness, we're being told that we need to learn to join with Jesus and the Holy Spirit to overlook the error. And many of us have practiced and tried. We, we, we do work with specifics. We try every day. We practice with our course lessons. We practice with forgiveness. And we practice with whatever's on, on the screen. We're dealing with a pain in the elbow. We work with it. You know, we offer taking that back inside and offering that up to the Holy Spirit. The things that we're watching on the news or we're hearing when we're talking to somebody on the phone that we don't agree with, the things that we have judgments about, the things that we have opinions about, the things that we have concerns about. We're working it and we're working with the specifics because that's how it works with purpose. Purpose is a decision in the mind. It's a choice. But it's kind of like a needle in a haystack. It's buried under a lot of hay. <laughs> you know, if you imagine you're a farmer and you're told there's a golden needle out in your field and uh, it's over there, it's under that big pile of hay. And you get the pitchfork out and you just start digging in there with your pitchfork that's why a lot of pathways to God are about negation, neti neti. It's not this, it's not that, not this piece of hay, not that. It takes a lot of uncovering to find that golden needle, but that golden needle is the purpose. And you need to be guided to unwind the mind to approach that purpose. That that purpose is there, it's absolutely there. Jesus says in the workbook, he says, salvation is among your thoughts. Find it. I remember the first time I read that in the workbook, I'm like, find it? Okay, I hope you're going to help me find it because uh, I seem to have spent some maybe millennium uh, digging around for that one and, and I haven't seemed to be able to find that one, but th that's what we're being guided to do is find it. So, only a constant purpose can endow events with stable meaning. As you're looking at a fragmented world and you're watching all these images and all this change and all these stories going on and you feel all kinds of conflicting emotions as you go through your, your daily experiences, it's because you haven't completely honed in on the homing beacon. You haven't honed in on that purpose because as soon as you come into that purpose in your mind, whew, the whole thing goes very, very still. The whole thing goes very, very clear. And the whole thing becomes to stabilize. It begins to stabilize as you embrace your purpose your purpose of forgiveness. Only a constant purpose can endow events with stable meaning. You aren't going to see a stabilized perception until you have a unified goal, until you have a unified purpose. Now, how does this work? How do I go from seemingly a very wishy-washy, fragmented, helter-skelter, herky-jerky, cracked perception to this this still calm perspective on the world well let's just look at this the ego made up different purposes for for the body for your life you know it may have different purposes for your relationships for your economic strivings for your culture for all kinds of things that you perceive in the world there's many, 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 many different purposes. And the ego generated and made all of that up, as, a, as I said, as a big uh, distraction or smokescreen. But as you start to tune in to your calling, to your function, to your purpose, that purpose will start to unify everything that the ego made. In other words, the Holy Spirit can retranslate everything that the ego made. So the ego made fragmented purposes, the Holy Spirit can use a single purpose to unify it. So imagine all of your skills and abilities that you perceive you have as a human being. 
uh, all the skills and abilities that you've been educated with, everything you've learned. You can drive a car, you know how to write, you know how, how to sing maybe, or to speak. You, you learn how to do particular jobs, specific jobs. You, you learn how to earn money and, and save money and all the skills and abilities that the ego made so that you'll adapt and adjust to being a human being, a surviving human being, and now you realize it's part of a trap that you still will feel guilty if you follow the, the roadways of the world. All of them end in death. There's no happy ending when you follow the ego's purposes and the ego's goals. But with a unified purpose, what if you gave that singing ability over to spirit? What if you gave that writing ability over to spirit? What if you gave your speaking ability over to spirit? What if you gave, some of you are probably bilingual, trilingual, maybe you speak of five, six languages, that's a, that's, those are skills that the ego has developed, but what if you gave that, that multi-language ability over to the spirit? What does that mean? It's, it's really getting to the finer points of what Francis mentioned last night, is that the Holy Spirit only sees the body as a means of communication. In fact, you could even take it one more step and say, the Holy Spirit only sees everything in the world as a communication device. Everything in the world are just symbols that now Jesus and the Holy Spirit, that clear, pristine purpose in your mind, they can use anything that the ego generated to take you back to this unified awareness, to take you back into the forgiven world, the happy dream, the quantum field. It's all the same. It doesn't matter what symbols and language you use, but the Spirit wants to take you back into your mind. You know, in Buddhism, they call it mindfulness. And this world was made by the ego to keep you mindless, to keep you unaware of your thoughts, unaware of your feelings, so distracted with the, the characters on the screen that you would never question and come back in into your mind. If I use a theater analogy, it's like the ego is so afraid of the light that it's like it's like come on, let's let's get away uh, from the light. You know, you're never going to make it back there, and there's no help. You know, you're just going to get punished if you go back toward that light. So it's, it's made a very dark theater, and it's got a screen. It's just like one of these old, old-time old movie theaters, and it gets you seated down in that theater. And then, as the movie gets playing, you start to forget that you're watching a movie. You actually start to get identified with the characters in the movie. And you get all emotional, because you get all wrapped up. You're not aware that you're in a movie theater anymore, you're not aware of the mind. You're not aware of the light. You're not aware of the film. You're not even aware of the projection. You've become so involved, so taken over by. You've, you, it's lesson number two. I have given everything I see all the meaning it has for me. And you get so wrapped up into the story of the movie that you forget the theater, the projector, the light, you forget everything else. You're just, you're so emotionally entangled in these interpretations that are going on that you forget that you're dreaming. You forget that you're just watching a movie. The Holy Spirit sees the movie as neutral. The movie isn't positive or negative. Dreams are dreams are dreams. To the Holy Spirit, the, all the dreams are the same. It's just like leaves blowing in the wind, you know. It's just the, the appearance of change is all the Holy Spirit sees. But the Holy Spirit is anchored in, and sustained in the light, so the Holy Spirit knows that none of the leaves and none of the wind is, is real. So it's just like this serene thing of leaves blowing in the wind. But to the extent that you get wrapped up in those characters, you get wrapped up in what's going on 
with that dream, that's the extent it gets terrifying. It's horrifying. It's extreme fear. And, and you may have bits and pieces where you say, well, it's not so bad. I'm, I'm not... There are bits and pieces of this, uh, of this dream that are not absolutely terrifying. There's actually, you know, you could say to Jesus, there's some that are quite nice, you know. Yeah, pretty good, yeah. And imagine that we're here this morning talking about purpose, and, and I'm just inviting you to come with me on a journey, and we're just going to, for a moment, we're going to hop off the screen. And, uh, and I'm meeting you in the theater, and, uh, oh, look, Jesus is coming out. He's coming out of the back. He's got popcorn for all three of us. Uh, you and I and Jesus are going to have some popcorn. Oh, nice big soda, refillable soda. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, we're all just going to sit there, and uh, the three of us are going to sit there and, uh, and watch the movie together. Now, as you're watching this movie with Jesus and I, I tell you, you may have some times where it's like seeing a life review. Imagine seeing your, it's not just what happened yesterday or the day before, but it's not only what happened in your past, but it's your whole life review. We'll say from birth to death, you know, it's, it's going to be, that's going to be the movie. The movie's actually a lot bigger than that. That's like the tiniest little sliver of the movie. It's so minuscule you probably wouldn't even know it's there if you were back even further, but that seems to be important. And then as you're watching it, and you're watching some of the things that you think you did, and you're munching on your popcorn, and then sometimes you you see a, you feel a little guilt for some of the things you said and did. You, go, you look at Jesus, you go, oops, sorry about that one. <laughs> oops. Sorry there. Ooh, that was a tough one. I like that one, though. That was a good moment there. That, you know, imagine doing the... It's still you're reviewing and you're still judging the film. And Jesus is very quiet. He's just got a big smile on his face and he's... He's throwing that popcorn in the air. He's catching it. He's just munching along, having a sip of the drink. Just smiling, not saying a word. Mm. Because the point of mind training is to practice coming back into that theater with, with spirit, with Jesus, because you have to learn to see that movie from a state of non-judgment. You can't keep reading meanings and judgments and opinions, good, bad, right, wrong, onto those bodies, onto those images, because that's where the guilt is generated. As long as you keep throwing judgments all over that screen, and you're just in the theater, and you still keep throwing judgments and opinions on that screen, you're going to be tempted to go back onto that screen. You're going to be tempted that's what reincarnation's about. It's a temptation <laughs> to still believe there's a there's a better way than than love. You know that's all it is. It's uh, Ken Wapnick. One time they were talking to him, asking him about deja vu, and he said, "Well, the whole world's deja vu. You know, <laughs> you're just you're just reliving what is already over. Imagining you're making the journey again. You're just." You're just reimagining what's already over and done. And that is the key point. Because if the script is written, if lesson number seven in, in the Course is true, I see only the past, like I'm only perceiving the past, then what makes me think that I can find my purpose in the past? What makes me think that I should be looking for my purpose in the world? You know, I know a lot of us were raised with, you know, find your calling, find your purpose. You know, are you to be a, a an ice skater or a, a sportscaster or a, a ballet dancer or a construction worker or a minister or a husband, wife, 
uh, a mother or a father, all these roles and concepts uh, are all part of the script. And, and what is the unifying factor among all these different roles and concepts is they have one unifying factor, and that's forgiveness. They're all unreal. They're all equally false. Not one single one of those roles was created by God. They're all projections of the ego. So Shakespeare had the famous quote, all the world's a stage and everyone must play their part. I did ask Jesus about that one time and he said, well, it's, it's mostly, it's, it's a helpful statement. He said, I'll make one additional correction all the world's a stage, and divine mind can play no part. I was like, oh, okay. Probably in the, in the Bible, one of the most famous passages from the New Testament, if you meet a Christian, you know, if the Christian doesn't know this, this saying from the Bible, they probably won't pass very well for a Christian, you know, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that he show, whosoever should believeth in him shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. If you're a Christian and you don't know that one, I don't know, they might throw you off in, to be something else. Uh, they might say you're an imposter. And Jesus takes that whole beautiful statement and he, he adds to it to, to make it correct. And instead of, instead of saying he gave his only begotten son, almost like as a sacrifice to pay the penalty for sin, he says he gave it to his only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave it to his only begotten son, that he whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have eternal life. So he went from gave his only begotten son, almost like a sacrifice on the cross, to he gave it to. What does he mean, he gave it to? It's talking metaphorically there about the real world, the happy dream. The happy dream of the Holy Spirit was given as a gift from the Holy Spirit to the sleeping Son of God. That he whosoever shall believeth in this happy dream shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. Oh, the happy dream will get you back to heaven. Not sacrifice, not penance, not punishment, not doing things or not doing things. And, and in the end, you even have to start to realize that all the functions, the many busy doings that the Holy Spirit will send you on, I've had a few of those over the last 33 years. He's had this body in 44 countries, and for a shy guy, he had me talking, giving talks at conferences, and basements, backyards, barbecues, festivals, ashrams. This body seemed to be all over the place, serving a calling of letting the voice for God speak through it. But, but you know, none of those body things that David ever seemed to do, or any, they weren't even our, the purpose. They were inspired by the purpose. I have to say, I, David would have never chosen any of that. I, I sometimes have to say, pinch me, what is going on? What happened? I gave you my, my will and my life, and I gave you everything to use for the healing of the universe, and now, wow, involuntarily, you've had these miracles lighting up my mind, and I've seen all these witnesses of happy, joyful People all over the world, smiling faces, hugs, laughter, tears of joy, mystical experiences, all these things that have happened over these last 33 years. And, and yet Jesus has always assured me, no, it's not about anything that the body does or doesn't do. The purpose that inspires even these busy doings is all in the mind. And... And actually, the purpose doesn't come into form. You're given a special function. You will seem to play out a part as a character, but that is all coming as an inspiration. 
like Frances was saying last night, you know, she, she was coming over to, to share with all of you last night and she just burst into tears. She was just in her, her apartment, she just came over, she burst into tears, she was just overcome, overwhelmed with all this love and gratitude. And I noticed what she said was, she said, and I, I didn't do a thing. She wasn't, she wasn't in there studying her course to prepare. Her purpose is the only choice talk. She wasn't in her room making preparations to join with all of you and everything. She was just in there connecting and just feeling whew, this deep, overwhelming love of of God and Jesus and everything and everyone coming in and then and then just coming forward to let it burst forth, let it radiate through. But when you're in that movie theater, if you forget about the theater, if you forget about your mind, if you forget about your thoughts and beliefs, and you are just so identified with that body, that character on the screen, it gets terrifying. It gets extremely terrifying because there is no escape on inside of that screen. As long as you believe you're in it, Jesus says you believe you're on the battlefield and the only way, he says, to find the peace is to go above the battleground, above the battlefield. He's like saying, come up with me, come back into the theater, come rise up in your mind and join with me, join with the light, join with the love, and you'll feel the relief that comes from joining with the one who is the comforter, who is the answer to the problem of time and space. So, it's very similar when Jesus talks about the holy instant. The holy instant is very synonymous with purpose, and Jesus says about the holy instant, you cannot prepare for the holy instant without placing it in the future. So this idea of preparation, you see how even that is tied into bodies. Preparation. We're so tied into believing we have to prepare the way to be healed. Prepare the way. We're so much identified with the characters on the screen that we have even taken our function, which is forgiveness, and we've projected that out onto the timeline, and that's why we feel so conflicted oftentimes. Am I serving God? Am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I on, it, moving in the right direction? There can be so much confusion when the mind is so identified with the body and with the behavior. So purpose is a choice in the mind, and, and that purpose is not dependent on anything of this world. That purpose is coming from your right mind. It's coming from the Holy Spirit and Jesus. And it will radiate through everything that you perceive. It will unify everything that you perceive. But that purpose cannot be confined to an object, an image, a body. There is no thing that exists in and of itself. Jesus talks about this in the workbook. Quantum physics talks about this. If you study quantum physics, it will tell you there is no world apart from consciousness. There, there is no observer and observed. There's only the quantum field which to the scientist is very mystical. It's, it's, it's very uh, mysterious. It's not mysterious to Jesus. Jesus is like, no, that's me and you eating the popcorn in, in the, the theater. That's what the quantum field is. It's when you're back with the, that unified spirit, then there's everything is calm because you're not getting caught up with anything on the surface. Now, I did look over the questions and, and one of the questions that came in from Laura, Laura, Laura Bryant from Illinois. I think I'm choosing your question because it, it actually, it's very, uh, has a lot of transfer value for all of us. 
And basically, Laura wrote in, she said, hello. Purpose is the only choice is something that has consistently confused me seemingly for a long time. But I do seem to be having clarity in mind about it more recently. So I just want to write what I've been getting. If the script is written, then there is no choice over what I seemingly do. And even though I can think there's a reason I'm doing something that isn't for healing or forgiveness, doesn't assume that I have a choice in what I do. So, Laura, beautiful, you've been following along these teachings and now you've brought in the script is written idea. Which, which is kind of like when you go to a movie theater and you're watching a movie. You know, you, it's already been, it's been filmed. It's in the can. You know, you're, you're just going in to observe something that has already been produced. It's already been edited. It's, it's already been finalized. It already has a beginning. It already has an ending. That's what a movie is. You know, you, it's something that's a product that you're going in and, and to watch. And, and basically the movie is the movie. It, you know, uh, it's not like you, you go in and you watch a movie and then you go and talk to your friends and you say, well, I saw this version of the movie, but um, what did you think? Which version of it did you see? As if there's hundreds or thousands or millions of visions and versions of a, of a movie, you, you are seeing the movie that is being distributed wherever, all over the world or wherever it's distributed, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a finite thing that's, that's done. It's over and done. You're simply watching something that's over and done, and you get caught up in it when you're in the theater, imagining that it's happening now. So that is an example of how the script is written, that movies is done. You're watching something that's the past, clearly the past. It's already been done and manufactured and distributed. It's clearly the past. But if you engage with that and you believe that it's happening now or it's currently happening, then you can get all caught up and you can forget that it's a movie. Uh, I know a lot of people that say, well, yeah, that's part of the fun of the fantasy. That you don't think I'm going to go spend $10, $15, or not much down here in Mexico, two for one, $2 <laughs> on Wednesdays for a movie. You're not going to spend whatever. You're not going to spend money to just go and, and sit there. Oh, yeah, another movie. Yep, yep. Watch those frames go by. Yep, just another movie, just another movie, just another movie. No, people go to a movie because they want to get caught up in the movie. They want to be entertained by the movie. They want to be swept away by the movie. They want to be engulfed by the movie. They want to feel some emotions connected to the movie. But your question is saying, if the script is written, then there is no choice over what I seemingly do. Now, that first sentence that you're saying, if the script is written, then there is no choice over what I seemingly do, you know that you are contradicting the whole human race in all of human experience <laughs> with that first sentence. Because, because everyone watching and everyone who's perceiving this world is thinking, what do you mean there's no choice of what I seemingly do? I could choose to, I could choose to raise my left hand, I could choose to lower it, I could choose to raise my right hand, I can choose to lower it. You know, it's a, it seems like to say I have no choice over speaking or closing my lips and being quiet. It seems to, that if there's no direct choice over behavior, that seems to contradict the most fundamental aspect of being a human being. And actually you're on the right track because you only have a choice in your mind of your purpose. You're, you're in that theater with Jesus and you're watching and the movie is already filmed. Everything that you perceive is, is part of a prearranged script and basically 
you're, it's seeming to be projected as if something's happening. Something's changing on the screen. Laura's changing, the world's changing, the, the, the ozone layer is changing, the politics are changing, the, the people are changing, the sky is changing, the food is changing, the pesticides are changing. I mean, it's, it's all this change is happening, and yet you don't have any direct control over that movie, but you do have your choice of purpose. There's so many people, it's interesting when I come across a lot of Course in Miracles teachers online and they go in all these groups and, and it's the same thing with philosophers and Christians and people from all religions. They always come up to me and they go, David, God gave us free will. And I say, what do you mean God gave us free will? And they say, well, God gave us free will, so that means we can pretty much do what we want to do. Well, let's go back to the clarification of terms in A Course in Miracles where Jesus tells us that God gave Christ free will. Okay? God gave Christ free will. That Christ, the will of Christ and the will of God are the same. So that's why Jesus said, the Father and I are one, because they share the same life, they say, the same eternity, the same will. They share everything. That's what the kingdom of heaven is about. Cause and effect are together, not apart. And Christ and God share the same will. So God did give Christ free will. But what about human beings? Did Christ give human beings did God give human beings free will? If God gave Christ free will, these are dream characters. These are characters that are part of a projection of the ego. What makes you think that human beings have free will if they're part of the ego's projection? Christ has free will. God has free will. To know I and the Father are one, that's when you know your will is free. But I would tell you, as long as you're asleep and dreaming and you're identified with the dream character, there's a better word for free will for human beings. I would call it imprisoned will. Imprisoned will. I know the philosophers throughout all time are always, you know, debate versus determinism versus free will. You know, that's a big philosophical debate. That's been going raging on for centuries. Well, I hate to bring it to a close here. What is this? Saturday morning. My watch isn't even working. But the time is gone. But we're saying, no, human beings don't have free will. God has free will. Christ has free will. In heaven there's free will, but in the sleeping mind of projections and images and guilt and pain and fear and shame, that's imprisoned will. So, what about this free will thing? Well, Jesus says that the only reflection of that divine free will that you seem to still have is choice. And that choice is only between one of two choices. You seem as a human being to have millions and billions and trillions of choices to make, but actually you only have one. You always only have one choice, and it's called the atonement. That Jesus discovered that. He's our way shower. That's why Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, because he discovered the escape hatch back to eternity, and it's called atonement. And now he's, he's with the Holy Spirit and, and the angels and everybody, they have provided this pathway back to heaven called A Course in Miracles. And to go back to the question that Laura is writing in, if the script is written, then there is no choice over what I seemingly do. Yeah, you've just hit the nail on the head, Laura. You have hit the nail on the head. You don't have direct control choice over the body, but you do have choice over which thought system you line up with. And what you do comes from what you think. So, in other words, 
imagine that the body of Laura was like a marionette and you believed you were Laura and so you believed you could raise hands and move hands and you could go on a diet, you could go fasting, you could do whatever you wanted to do. You believed you were the character, but actually that was all part of a prearranged script that was all the past that's already over and gone. And you're simply reliving what has already gone by, imagining that you're making the journey again. And yet the journey really isn't a linear journey. It's not the journey of Laura in time and space. It's more the journey into my, the purpose of the Holy Spirit and Jesus in the mind. Now that's a journey. So if you learn to tap into that purpose, then you can let go of what Laura does or doesn't do. You don't have to be, have all that guilt and stress and strain about do I make the right move? Did I take the right action? Did I take the right branch in the road? Or am I off on a, a far lost journey? You are zooming into your purpose. And it's what Francis was saying last night. Once you come zooming into that purpose, then you can let go of be concern for everything else. Take no thought for what you shall wear or what you shall eat. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all else shall be added unto you. The happy dream shall be added unto you. The real world, the forgiven world, all that shall be added unto you. Because God so loved the world that he gave it to his only begotten Son. How many sons of God are there? Well, there's only one. It's the Christ, and that, that's not a, a, a son or a daughter, it's not a male or a female. That's, that's a beautiful, pure idea, the Christ idea that forever lives in the mind of God. It's an idea in the mind of God. And the pathway towards that pristine, beautiful Christ identity is the purpose of forgiveness. So, as you answer your calling, you realize that in answering that calling, everything else, without exception, is taken care of. In other words, the behavior becomes almost like an autopilot. If, if you are lining up with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, then it's more like St. Augustine. I love St. Augustine. He, he had this beautiful phrase many, many years ago. He said, love and do what you will. Not saying love and do anything you want, but he's saying love and in the alignment with love, in the alignment with purpose, whatever flows from your behavior, the laughter, the joy, the smiles, the hugs, all those wonderful expressions, temporary expressions of that divine love will come involuntarily, miraculously flowing through you because, because you're lined up. And when you aren't lined up, when you seem to believe the wrong mind is, a, is an actual choice, attack could be real and you still feel an attraction to guilt or attraction to fear, then the body will again follow that and, and bodies have been known to do some pretty strange things in this world. <laughs> they seem to have diseases, they seem to fight each other, they seem to argue, they seem to compete. They seem to go to war, and there's even within the linear perception, it's ego's perception, it seems that one body can actually destroy another body. What a wicked dream that wrong-minded perception is, but it's all it is, is it's the ego's purpose projected out so that you're interpreting the attack as happening in the form. You're interpreting the killing happening as out there. Even people that are really concerned about, let's say, killing animals and vegetarianism and so forth, there's still the perception is, is that, that the animal is dying. But what I'm saying is, is, is the death wish is in the mind. It's almost like wearing these dark glasses, these ego glasses, and then forgive them for they know not what they do. When you've got those dark glasses on, everything you perceive, there is nothing that's going to be helpful with those dark glasses on. You're going to have to get back into that theater and you're going to have to help Jesus remove the glasses 
And if you take the glasses off with Jesus in the theater and you really start to enjoy watching the movie with Jesus, eventually you're going to get so happy that he's going to say, okay, now you're ready. I'm going to swoop you up and we're going to go back towards the, the projector. And he's going to swoop you out of the theater. And he's taking you back towards that beam of light in the theater. And he's going to take you back. And you're going to zoom right in and he's going to take you in and you're going to phew, pass through the film. Pass through the film, which is the ego and go right into the light, far beyond a, a movie screen, far beyond a movie theater, far beyond little images passing in front of that light. He'll take you right back into that Christ light, right back into that God light, because of course that's all that's real is the light. The light is all that's real. Last night, Daniela, you were bringing up things that you still value. Francis was talking to you, and you were saying, well, this, I still like to run, I like to train, and there's still things that I want in the world. I can totally relate to that, Daniela. I, I trained for 10K race. I actually, years ago, you know, I thought, the parable of David, I thought, you know, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run a race. And so I went up, and there was a church nearby, to where I lived, and it had this driveway that went all the way flat, all the way around the church. And I would go up there, and I would just run and run and train and train and train, just run in circles around this church for hours, actually, uh, so I could seemingly build my stamina up and, and get really fit. I had some mystical experiences. I mean, the, the doctors said it was endorphins, but I was like, whew, I was, I was losing awareness of the body. I was having some, running around this church, I was actually having a, like a very mystical experiences, losing awareness of my body, of how it felt, losing awareness, awareness of the pavement. And yet, that still was part of a self-concept that was involving images. Obviously it involved the body and involved my perception of myself as David and so forth. And then I found A Course in Miracles, I started to practice it, I got into it, I got deeper into it, I started having, I had a revelatory experience where I, the whole universe disappeared, I had another revelatory experience where I was in the light and the whole world disappeared. I had a third revelatory experience where the whole world just disappeared. After the third one, I'm like, okay, you know, Jesus, you got me. I, I mean, that's just, talk about blowing me away. You're like blowing my mind with this light. You take me right back it's past the projector into the light three times, you got me, you know. All, all right, I'll, I'll speak whatever you want me to speak. I'll, I'm yours, you know. You got me, you convinced me, I'm yours. And, and actually, around 2003, I was drawn down to Argentina, where Marina's from, I was down there. And then I started coming to Colombia, right where you're from, and I started going to Cali, and then I went to Bogota, then I went to Medellin. And I went to a, a center in Medellin, where you're at right now, and it was a full-time Course in Miracles center, seven days a week. I mean, it was a full seven-day-a-week Course in Miracles Center. And the woman who was in charge of it, her name was Priscilla. And she got me over there, and she said, Here, here's our little teacher's room, David. This is where the teacher stays, and then you'll come out, and we'll get a big group of people, and you'll speak. And then uh, this other woman, Isabel Christina from Medellin, I think she worked, I forget, a, a chocolate factory or something, but she came to Priscilla and she said, I must translate for David. I must translate for David. So Priscilla said, great, go ahead. And so I had these long sessions in Medellin that would go morning, afternoon, and night. I mean, we went for hours and hours. I remember one day with Isabel, Christina translating for me, and we went the whole day until, I think it was about 11 o'clock at night, and half the people were just barely hanging on in there. And Isabel 
was translating for like eight or nine hours, and she was as sharp as a tack. She was leaning forward in her chair, kind of like, Preguntas? Preguntas? More questions? Like, come on. She was so lit up. I'm like, whoa, Jesus, you send in some translators. Like, she is like on fire for God. We've been here for like eight or nine hours, and she's bright as can be, waiting for more questions. And finally, we had to just call it a night. <laughs> you know, buenas noches. Finally, it's like, okay, everybody can go home. Now, Francis was telling you that, that as long as you have a belief in sacrifice, like, like following the Holy Spirit and Jesus is going to cost you something, then there's going to be fear. And, and you did say when, when you tuned in to Francis and I and Marina when we had that, that live session going on there, that, that some fear started to come up. And that, that's very common. I mean, when we start to really tune in to the awakening, then it's like Jesus and Spirit, they get our attention, and then the ego is like, ah, ah, watch it here. Watch it, watch it, watch it. Don't go play with that fire. You know, you can go play over there, but don't go play with the fire of the Holy Spirit and Jesus, because you're, it's going to be a bad ending. But... What happened with me is I ended up going back to Medellin and joining with a, another friend in Bogota, and we got that, that book that's the, the, the smaller book of A Course in Miracles that's printed on Bible paper uh, down there in South America. My, Alberto and I joined in Colombia to get that book printed. We joined with the publishers. It took us two years. I took a whole box to Medellin. That was the first place I went with that new book. And I opened a big box. And though it took, the students grabbed everything in that box. It took them less than a minute to empty out a huge box because they were so thirsty for this Course in Miracles. And my friend Isabel, we have stayed in contact on all these years. She did leave Medellin. She went over to France to study, to learn French. So she's translated for me in French. She, she went to Barcelona, where she lives right now. And, and that woman, that young woman who just put her hand up and said, I have to translate for David, we have been lifelong friends over many, many years doing it for Jesus. She's hosted me back to Barcelona again, where I've gone there. And we go a whole day, a whole weekend with her translating for me. Uh, that was a, a few years ago. And so I've known her since back in the mid-2000s, and now here we are, 2019. Now that's an example of when you give yourself over. I know you've, you've been communicating with Anna. I know, you know you've been saying it'd be good to have a gathering down here. That's the beginnings of allowing yourself to be used for communication that really will help free your mind up. You have bilingual skills. Those are really helpful for us that don't speak Spanish. Those are huge. Marina comes here from Argentina, and everybody's like, oh, thank God. I mean, look at the faces. Everybody is smiling in the thing. It's like, thank God we got somebody who can speak Spanish. We're here in Mexico. We're here trying to shine our light and handle things. It's like dropping us on Pluto or Mars or something. We need, we need to be able to... to talk and, and translate, and, and these we need to have translators. So it's not like Jesus is, is like saying, oh, maybe, maybe, maybe. No, he's like, what was the word that you used last night, Francis, where he's like, has this love, this, this overwhelming love. Overwhelming appeal. Overwhelming appeal. You, that's how you look in Jesus' eyes, you know. He's like thinking, hmm, Daniela down there in Medellin. That has overwhelming appeal for me in my plan. <laughs> like, and the ego's going, oh, no, no, no. You do not mess with that fire. Don't even think about it. Don't even think about it. But that's what's happened. I mean, when I met Frances, she was down in Australia. You saw her shining and bursting with all that joy last night. When I met her, she was down there. She was... She was successful. She shared about it. She, 
she'd worked on her diet, she's done all these things, she's studying A Course in Miracles, and then she's thinking, wait a minute, all this diet stuff doesn't go with A Course in Miracles. So she had to make a decision. Do I go with the diet stuff or the Course? She went with the Course. Then she came to a week-long retreat with me up in Noosa. That was mind-blowing. And then she, she, like me, started having these mystical experiences where this loud voice in her mind would just speak to her. Where one time we met and our two bodies were talking, having a conversation, and then the Spirit is speaking while Francis and I are talking to each other. The Spirit is speaking to her in her mind directly. And it's, it's, tell, it's informing her, it's telling her things. These things were so convincing that, that even though she had what the world would call a very successful life, she was married, she owned her own company, she had her, owned her own business, she had a couple houses with her husband, and very much on top of the world, as the world would say, a success story. You know, it, and she had it all. She really had it all. And yet, when her calling came, she jumped at it. She went for it. She uh, had things that she, even when she's taken what the world would call big steps of, of letting go of things and concepts of the world, if you, if you talk to Frances, she will tell you it hasn't felt like a sacrifice. Like every single time a big chunk of the iceberg would, would fall back into the ocean, she knew she was ready for it. So she would just watch it crack off and fall down. She, she wasn't thinking she was like, Joan of Arc, you know, making some kind of big heroic m maneuver or choice for the whole world. It was more like she was just wanting God, wanting to know her true identity. And then the other things would just fall off like chunks, big chunks of iceberg. And she wouldn't even, even be concerned about them. Like, okay, well, that's gone now, you know, no big deal. If, if, if you really listen to her, and we'll, she'll be back on this weekend too, but she will tell you, this has not been a sacrificial journey, and I can I share the same thing. You know, I've been in the course since for 33 years. I would not use the word sacrifice at all to describe my journey into purpose. There's just been joy. There's been happiness. There's been so many miracles. I needed floods of miracles to convince me. I always say I, I was a slow learner, so I needed lots and lots of miracles to convince me. But I've had that. And it's been the most amazing, miraculous journey. But it's a journey into the mind. It's not really a linear journey. It's not a journey of a person. All the, the famous fairy tales and myths are always the hero's journey in form. And Jesus has a passage in the Course. It's, it's, it's called the hero. It's a, it's a subsection of the chapter at the, toward the end of the text. And it's the hero of the dream. And it's right tucked in there. He's, he's reinforcing first the hero, the, the dreamer of the dream that Ken and, and I have been experiencing. And, and then he just reminds you as, as, a, as an opposite or as a, a contradiction, the hero of the dream is the serial adventures of the body. <laughs> you know, serial adventures of the body. It's like Jesus is back in the theater going, oh, please, don't get too wrapped up with, with the movie because that's just the serial adventures of the body. That really doesn't have anything to do with reality. So, Laura, thank you so much for your question. Daniela, thank you so much for everything that you shared. All of you are, are contributing. We're all coming to the same healing and understanding together. And also, Laura, the thing I liked about it, you basically were, were using the example of for example, if I think I'm, I have a goal of losing weight and then I start fasting, the assumption is I did that, the fasting, to lose the weight. But, you put in capital letters, but the script is written. So I'm seemingly going to fast regardless of what purpose I think it's for. In other words, the behavior is all part of a, a prearranged plan. And then the real question is the purpose. If your purpose is forgiveness, I will guarantee you will be supremely happy, supremely joyful, and supremely peaceful. 
if your purpose has causes in the past and effects in the world, you know how I always talk about spurious cause-effect relationships, fasting, lose weight. Overeat, gain weight. You see, those are just those are just cause-effect relationships that the ego has projected out and it's given food a purpose and not e eating food a purpose and the weight another purpose and it's trying to make a connection where there is no connection. The only connection is they're all illusions. That's the only connection. From forgiveness you start to see it's all the same thing. The fasting, the losing weight, the eating, the gaining weight, those are spurious. You know, in the Matrix, I love that, you know, when they had this this fight scene with Morpheus and Neo, and and then Neo's trying to figure out why he lost to Morpheus in the, the fight scene, and he says, You were just you were just too fast. You were just too fast, too strong. And Morpheus says, You really believe that's air that you're breathing? Morpheus takes him right down to the assumption, not the, 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 about the fight or the, how, who's fast or who's strong, but he's, he's saying, you really believe that that's air that you're breathing. What a question! What an undoing question Morpheus unloads at that point, because he's like trying to disengage Neo from the simulation. He's saying, you're not really a character and this isn't really going, this isn't a real fight and this isn't really air that you're breathing. He's, he's inviting back into the mind, back into the vastness, back into the purpose. What a beautiful question. Do you really believe that's air you're breathing? So I, I thank you, Laura, for bringing that up because you're showing again that the spurious cause-effect relationships about for every action there's a reaction. Everything is part of a mass hypnosis. It's mass programming. It's mass conditioning. It's all egoic trying to convince us that there are actions and reactions in the world that are real. That there are things that come before other things. That there are things that produce other things. And I've said it many, many times, but purpose is the only choice. Purpose is the only way that you see that the causes and the effects that seem to be in the world are both the same. They're both unreal. One doesn't cause the other. It's all part of a mesmerism. That's what Mary Baker Eddy called it. It's a mesmerism. It's a trick. This is reminding me of Muna. Your question, I just got your question this morning and I was just sharing a bit of it with, the, with the, those here. Because uh, it was a beautiful question, but the part of the question, Muna, that, that I love the most the one that I really liked, it really tickled me when you got uh, toward the end where you were talking about um, that fourth that fourth generator. Let's see if I can find it here. Basically, you were saying that recently before you woke up, uh, here it is, a few years ago, I woke up presumably a few seconds before I was supposed to, and I saw in my mind that the fourth generator the ego turns on every morning to make me believe I am in the world was not turned on yet. An ego slip-up. So, I saw clearly what the ego does to convince me I am in the world. Oh. Moon, and that was delicious. That was the delicious sentence you shared. You had that, that glimpse a few years ago where it's almost like a pre-waking state, coming out of a dream state, and, and you were in the, the vastness, and you weren't fooled by the trickery of the projection. You were in like the pre-projection mode. <laughs> And which is a glorious glimpse. It was a miracle. That was a miracle that you experienced. And I was sharing that this morning with, with Francis and Svava and those in the studio. I was like, oh, Muna, it was delicious. Because, because that's analogous to what I've been talking about, about coming back into that theater with Jesus. 
it's so calm there in the theater. It's such a calm presence in the theater. And yet, you were writing in, it's been a very intense time for you because the, of the, the draw, the temptation to, to forget that calmness in the mind and, and to get wrapped up into the story again. So I'm going to, I'll spend some time, I think as we go along this weekend, we'll get into to some of these questions. I mean, uh, this morning, yeah, it was so beautiful. Muna, you just poured your heart out. Frank, you just poured your heart out. And Holly from Australia, you just, I mean, those, those are the three, uh, the three questions and, and expressions that came to me this morning. And my heart was so touched in reading these because you all just, it was such a strong call for love. It's such a, such a strong cry for, for forgiveness, for relief. You know, it reminds me, um, recently, a couple days ago, Francis went to see the movie The Joker uh, that's been released. And, and she was so grateful to see The Joker because in the movie, this one that was just re released with uh, Joaquin Phoenix playing the lead role, it just showed all the the points where the confusion came in, like, like not being able to understand the world, looking for love, looking for nurturing, looking for kindness, and then having experiences in the world that were so dark, so crazy, so terrifying. But, but this was, you might say, uh, showing the Joker character and, and how he came to be in the Batman series, in the DC comedy, you know, comics. Uh, it was really showing that, that when the Holy Spirit was given to us as the answer to this dream of separation, that to not align with the Holy Spirit, but to, to buy the bait, to fall asleep, to go for the ego, it has it has brought on a hallucination of a nightmare. And then, what was the movie, The Batman Returns? Or Batman, I think it's... There was another Batman. The second one. Dark Knight, yeah. There was a time, I remember, I think we were in Utah when Frances started watching you know, the different Batman movies and she was fascinated with Dark Knight that particular version of Batman. She was like, oh my God, it's so rich with teaching symbols that she did, you edited together a, a whole yeah. movie, a mini movie. Frances made, before she's made Take Me Home, she made a mi mini movie of Dark Knight. This was her early days prior to her directing a major motion picture. She made a mini movie of Dark Knight and then when she went to see the Joker recently, a couple of days ago or whatever, she went in there and she was like, oh, that was like the missing piece, almost like the jewel that goes with the Dark Knight, because it, it really showed all these calls for love of the Joker character that was in Dark Knight. You could see all that the Joker went through, all these calls for love. And, and that's all we're ever doing, is calling for love or extending love. That we're never doing anything wrong, we're only, to the Holy Spirit, calling for love or extending love. There's no, there's no wrongness in calling for love. There's no wrongness in extending love. It's like, it's like Sylvia, when you were talking yesterday and you were just pouring your heart out about the stuck point that you have with this neighbor and how you know you really know that there's a lesson there you know that there's a forgiveness lesson but the temptation to blame the temptation to to find this neighbor wrong was like this huge call it was it's like what that is, what that temptation to blame that neighbor is, is this, this insidious belief in attack. You know, the belief that attack is real. It's, 
the Holy Spirit knows that there is no such thing. The mind cannot attack. You can't attack God. You can't separate from God. The Holy Spirit and Jesus know that attack is absolutely impossible. And that's what you're praying for. You're praying, reach me, show me, help me, I need to know this. But this insidious, it's like a little gnat or a little fly that's in your face, and you're just like, get away. This is not my purpose, but it keeps coming and coming like a little gnat. It wants to land on your eyebrow. It's on your lip. It's up your nose. This little gnat, you know, you're trying to get it away, but it just keeps coming back. That is what this call for love is about. We have to learn to join with the Holy Spirit and Jesus to see past the behaviors, see past the voice of this neighbor when she called you on the phone, to see past all the appearances of, of everything she said or her tone of voice and all those nuances that the ego is grabbing on to build its case and attack. And you have to realize that you're doing a great thing for you and for the whole universe to connect, to find that purpose of forgiveness. You're doing this for everyone and everything in all of history. This isn't just about Sylvia. This is for everyone. And to find this purpose, you have to be willing, we'll say, to either be right or happy. You either, I'm going to put it in a context, I'm not talking about personally right. I'm not talking about Sylvia being right. You either have to be right about the way that the ego set up this dark night world, this whole dark world of time and space. You either have to be right about the way the ego set it all up, or happy that it's not true, that it could never be true, that it has no reality whatsoever. God did not create it. It could, it could never even have a semblance of anything. There is no gnat. That gnat that seems to not go away was not created by God. God is a God of love, pure love. So here's the key. This is going to be the key. My key of the morning is... When we talk about this world and how the ego is the death wish that generated this world, here's what Jesus says. He says, what you believe, believe. You know how Francis talked about belief, how, how powerful the mind is with beliefs. What you believe you did, you now believe it's being done to you in the world. In other words, whatever you believe you did in your mind, that attack, that separation from God, is now acted out. The ego has generated a hallucination, except now what you think you de did is being done to you. The thing that your neighbor is acting out in your perception, if you roll it back to the mind, you first have to believe you did it before they can seem to do it. The ego doesn't want you to see that. The ego is going to say, no, they're just plain wrong. They're disrespectful, they're not loving, they're arrogant, they're snobbish. You know, it's going to fling all kinds of justifications to try to make you think that they're the cause of the upset, that they're to blame, that they're actually to blame. But what Jesus is doing with all of us, he's calling us back into that movie theater and he's saying, no, no, come back. What you think you did, you didn't do. And what is that but the belief in separation? He's, he is a way shower. The reason Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life is because he had a, a total realization that the separation from God was impossible. And he didn't even mind if it cost him the whole world. He would rather remember the kingdom of heaven. He would rather remember the divine love of our Creator, then futz around with a bunch of images. He wasn't concerned about the disappearance of the universe. He wasn't concerned about leaving this world behind because he found the truth. And that's what it says in the Bible, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. That's where we come back to free will. 
we see our will and God's will are the same. We see that, that love is part of our divine will, not attack, justifying blame, justifying guilt, those things. So, I mean, every one of you that has been speaking up on this profound weekend has been offering a gift because as Francis told you, Sylvia, you, just by you sharing it, just by you offering that up, just by you opening up, you, you gave your gift. And you showed all of us that we can do the same. We don't have to hide these secret private thoughts. We don't have to hide these issues. That's what Greg was talking about when he was talking about having to stop the car and to get out. That was the rest of the story he was telling Jeffrey was when that car had to stop and he needed to get out. He needed to get out of that car because there was some egoic judgments and private thoughts that were going on in his mind and, and Greg was saying, I can't tolerate this. I'm not just going to actively tolerate this mind wandering. I need to get out of the car. Stop the car. And Jesus is basically saying, if you'll join me, you need to have that same willingness with, with your mind in this world. I had a friend years ago named Dorothy, and she was so happy, rosy cheeks, and I met her in Roscoe, New York, with, up with Ken and Gloria Wapnick, and, and she was laughing at everything. She just was bursting and laughed. Everything she would say, she would burst out laughing, and burst out laughing. And I said, uh, <clears throat> how did this spiritual journey start for you? And she laughed and laughed and she said, I don't know, one day I just said, stop the world, I want to get off. And I was like, yes! You see that? Stop the world, I want to get off. If the ego is, is the belief in change, and God is eternal, and Christ is eternal, and who we are is eternal, and the Holy Spirit is even eternal. If, if heaven is real, and everything's eternal, and the ego is the belief in change, wait a minute, eternity doesn't change. What's eternity? Everlasting, never-ending, infinite, no beginning, no end. Okay, that's just, we've, we've forgotten heaven, but it's, wow, it's, it's eternal. It's not a long, heaven is not a long time. Heaven is, there is no time. There's no beginning, there's no end, there's no minutes, there's no seconds, there's no years, there's no days. Just isness. God is isness. So heaven is isness, and the ego is the belief that you can change your identity from eternity to time. That's, that's what change is. The belief you can leave eternity and make up time, and make up an identity that's not like Christ, a body identity, and make up a time identity instead of an eternity identity. Oh, so the ego is the belief in change. And then what does it do but project a world of change? And Jesus is saying, the ego's not really you. The ego isn't real. The ego wasn't created. Change is impossible. And you're going to have to join with me in a purpose to show you the unreality of the ego and the unreality of change. In fact, that's the, the YouTube. Some of you might have seen the YouTube that just came out. Seek not to change the changing. Ah, well, if the ego is the changing, seek not to change the ego. And the world is changing. Seek not to change the world. Seek rather to what? Change your mind about the world. Change your mind about the changing. What does that mean? Accept eternity. That's all it means. Accept eternity. Come back to the light. Come back to the oneness. Come back to the eternal nature that you truly are. Don't invest in what seems to be changing because it's a trick. This relates to Laura's question. Seek not to change the world. Seek rather to change your mind about the world. Have a new purpose, a new purpose for seeing the whole world, forgiveness, and then you wake up to eternity. And Laura was saying, well, if I'm thinking I, I'm going to fast and I'm going to lose weight and all these other things, 
All that is changing the weight of the body, the shape of the body is an attempt to what? Change the changing. The body is ever changing. Why would you try to change the changing? That's really complex. And to even believe you can change the changing is, is ridiculous. You know, that's what you're seeing. If the script is written, would you go to a movie, for example, and you go in and you sit in the movie theater and you're watching, a, let's just pick, I always like to pick a classic movie, Gone with the Wind, Rhett Butler, you know, Rhett Butler, Scarlet. And then there's that famous scene where Rhett Butler turns to Scarlet and says, frankly, my darling, I don't give a damn. Well, imagine if you were sitting and watching the movie and, and you went, don't treat her that way. Don't treat her, don't speak to her that way. I do not like that. You are abusing her. That is verbal abuse, Rhett. I'm not going to stand for it. I'm going to come back on Saturday and buy another ticket. I'm going to watch this movie again. You better be on the lookout because I'm watching you, Rhett. And if you say that to her again, I'm going to get you. I'm going to change you. So you go on Saturday, you buy the ticket, you go in there, you come to that part of the movie, you're like all anticipating. You want Rhett to behave. Treat her like a lady. You, know, you better, better change, Rhett. You better change. You better treat her right. And then you watch the movie and you're like, ah, he did it again. Damn, Rhett. Damn you, Rhett. I told you to treat her like a lady. I'm coming back tomorrow, Sunday. I'm going to buy another ticket to this movie, Gone with the Wind. I'm going to watch this movie again. I come to that scene. You better watch it. You better watch it. And then she comes on Sunday. This is the predicament of, of the ego. You have trouble with relationships, you have trouble with what's going on with your, your world, with your life, with the environment, with the body, with whatever. It's like you're watching this movie that's actually already over and done. It's in the can. It's gone. Jesus is saying, you're just reviewing mentally what has already gone by. The Holy Spirit has already handled this movie. And all the Holy Spirit is saying is, come back with me and watch the movie. Let's have some fun with this movie. But if you keep trying to change that movie, trying to change Rhett Butler, trying to change your body, it's too fat, it's too skinny, trying to change your neighbor, trying to change that, that dog that's barking, that's bothering you, trying to change where you live, the power goes out. I'm warning you, power you better stay on. You know, if you... If you really feel that this darkened glass, that you're going to change the script, not a chance, not a chance. You have the only reverberation of free will that you have left is how you look upon the movie, how you look upon the dream. I have a suggestion, the dreamer of the dream, Ken knows that, it's very happy, it's I, I, would, I would suggest the dreamer of the dream. I would suggest the dreamer of the dream because the dreamer of dream is what? Is your purpose. And purpose is what? Your only choice. The only way to heal. The only way to be happy. The only way to be peaceful. The only way to be consistently joyful is to join with the Holy Spirit, because the Holy Spirit and Jesus just wants you to see that you're the dreamer of this dream. Now, why is it so important? Why is this purpose so focused on seeing you're the dreamer of the dream? Because that's the only way you can change the purpose. If the ego made the world, made the whole cosmos in hatred, unless you join with the Holy Spirit and Jesus in this dreamer of the dream perspective, 
then it seems like you're at the mercy of something that's happened that you have no control over. And it's basically saying you have no control over your mind. Wait a minute, that's not what the yogis taught us, that's not what the mystics taught us, that's not what Jesus is teaching us. Wait a minute, if Buddha was teaching mind training, discipline, mind discipline, come to think of it, all the saints and mystics have been teaching us mind training, discipline, mental discipline. Jesus is simply saying, you need to do this mind training. He says this is a course in mind training. He's inviting you to participate in a mind training program that will bring you back to the dreamer state of mind and see not only that you're the dreamer of the dream, but you've always been this. In other words, there's a, there's a real you in heaven, but you were never that character. You never played any of the parts. I love listening to people who have these great insights about roles. Like I can talk to you week after week, month after month, and year after year about let, loosen up from these roles because these roles that your mind is identifying with are guilt-inducing. They're, they're shame-inducing. They're pain-inducing. And I can say loosen up from the roles. Let the Holy Spirit unwind you from that. But I remember one time I was listening to I think it was an interview with Richard Gere. And some of you know Richard Gere is a, is a Buddhist. And Richard Gere was commenting that he's played all these roles as an actor over the years. And he's so grateful for having played all the roles because he's starting to see that he's none of them. I was like, Richard! Oh, oh. say it like it is for the whole, like a true Buddhist for the whole universe. He's none of the roles. Isn't that a beautiful? That's like Muna saying, I woke up before the ego could turn on the fourth generator. You know, I had a glimpse of, of how free I am when I don't buy into the characters and I don't get all wrapped up in the attachments in, in the movie. So, Wow, this is, what a ride, what a journey that we're on. This is so enlivening because you are at the, at the beginning of, of this awakening and I, I love everything that you're sharing. I'll, I'll go into some more specifics here, but I, I love everything that you're sharing because you're pouring your heart out. You're not leaving anything back Back, you're pouring it all on the table. You're just saying, here's what's going on, here's what I'm experiencing, here's what I'm facing, here's what I'm feeling. I'm going to be transparent, I'm not going to hide anything, I'm not going to pretend that things are good if I don't feel good. I'm going to speak it up, I'm not going to hide anything. And that is a key to the healing. It's the transparency is the key. Because that transparency is basically saying, Holy Spirit, Jesus, I'm not going to hide anything from you. I'm not going to play a game and try to pretend something. This is it. Sometimes it's, it's raw, but this is what I am experiencing. And I have a prayer. I have a prayer to let go. I have a prayer to let go of believing that this is real, these thoughts, these images, these appearances. I will take a time here to go through a couple more because these are very heartfelt prayers. Holly is, has written in from Australia and and this is the this is healing through relationship this is this is what the course is all about this is why you signed up for this course so that when the intensity in the unconscious mind came up you you had an option you had a presence 
you had mighty companions, you had all the support of spirit to be with you during what seems to be a very overwhelmingly intense time. I better take, this is a good relationship question, I better take a sip of iced tea before I delve into this one. Better have a big gulp. Okay, Holly writes, I want to begin with gratitude and say deeply, thank you for opening the doors and putting in the effort. I have signed up at the last second <clears throat> as I feel a calling and a need. I have seemingly gone through an illusion, but that is bringing up a great deal of upset, guilt, and pain. I try to make large shifts only when it feels guided by the Holy Spirit, but I often don't understand the why I am doing it, especially when I feel so wrought out in the process, such as the PhD and recently a relationship. The relationship was a horribly painful dredging up of layers and layers of crap. It was rather upsetting, virtually the whole time in my mind, but I stayed with it as I was not desiring a relationship, but it felt very guided and it was given. I thought the point of the relationship was to expose the guilt in my mind. I had been single for years because I had wanted to commit to, to the Jesus and the Course first. Now. The relationship has ended, and I am experiencing new layers of guilt for choices that I made and being too aloof while I processed my emotions. I always feared that he would take my emotions as his fault and that I could not adequately explain the experiences were a reflection of my own guilt, and I had to process them in my own ways using levels of mind, prayer, and meditation. All this amongst my already very busy PhD schedule and my other commitments, and anemia, apparently, which I need a transfusion for. Why have I chosen this? I am hoping to find some clarity with this weekend. I am working on forgiving his anxiety and understand a lot of my upset is due to my expectations of someone else. I imagine that I played my part perfectly, and if the true purpose of the relationship was to expose both of our guilt for healing, which I imagine could be true, then I pray for acceptance and peace. At the moment, I am left feeling quite crazy unworthy and unsettled in the seat of my true identity. Thanks for letting me bang on about it. Yours in love, always, Holly. So, Holly, thank you, because you're coming and you're pouring your heart out right at this point, and, and everyone watching has, has been through some type of breakup, some type of perceived abandonment or, or something that we had such hope for. Uh, we had such hope for happiness with and, and were trusting so much that it would be carried forth into a, a place of happiness and bursting happiness. And then the, the, the seeming guilt that comes in with the coulda, woulda, shoulda kind of, could I have done something different? Should I have started this? Could I have managed my life differently? I'm going for a PhD and now I'm taking on a relationship and then maybe my plate got too full and I was not able to adequately pray or handle or decide. And, and the guilt that you're experiencing right now is, is, is like looking, re, revisiting perhaps the, some of the memories of the relationship, and we've all done this, where we, where we come out of a relationship and then right away the, the, the memories start playing. 
as if we're getting like a life review of the, of the relationship. It doesn't matter if it's two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years, 80 years, it doesn't really matter the length of it. We all go back and we revisit these things, thinking I could have made a different decision, I could have made a better decision. Looking at the situations and thinking, in this situation, I think I could have made a better decision. I could have said something different. I, my tone of voice could have been different. I could have been more loving. I could have been more accepting. And in this situation, you know, we, we think the key points of the relationship. Almost like somebody who, who's reviewing their career maybe thinks of the key points. Like, wow, I could have had a career if I had just retired from McDonald's. I shouldn't have stayed there for 25 years <laughs> flipping those burgers. I don't know what I was thinking. There's a whole world out there, a whole career I could have had, but I just kept flipping those burgers, you know, for 25 years, rehashing. And, and what we start to realize is that we're rehashing the situations and the memories and we're looking for what could have been done differently. What could I have changed? to bring about a better outcome. And this is where purpose is the only choice comes in, because the only thing that could have been different with anything, and I mean anything, throughout all of history, throughout this relationship, throughout all of time, is the purpose. The only thing we have the power to shift is the purpose in our mind. And of course that purpose will take us off the hook entirely, because the hook of guilt is the ego. And that's of course why forgiveness is a gift to yourself, because when we fully accept forgiveness, we take all the innocence and all the happiness and joy that comes from that decision. We are off the hook. In fact, Jesus is showing us we were never on the hook. That's, it's not like we were on the hook and he got us off, that he rescued us from the hook. He just was like saying, yeah, you've had some mental problems <laughs> going on here, and you've been doing this to yourself, but not really. It wasn't really the real you. So, so I think the key thing is, the only way we can come into purpose is we have to realize that it's this moment. It's, it's not something that, that is offered like on some kind of a factory line, where you know we have to kind of figure out where on the factory line this purpose is, it's, it's in this moment. It's the holy instant. It's, it's really becoming present is where we find that innocence. Really going deep into the moment where we find that peace, that serenity. And then when we look at the purposes of the world for the body, for the, purpose, for the person, for our worldly life, what is it that those many, many purposes, we're trying to juggle a lot of different things, like you're saying PhD and a relationship, that's quite a, I did that too when I was in grad school. Ah, oh, most intense time in my whole life was trying to juggle my first relationship, my first romantic relationship and grad school at the same time. I thought it was going to be the death of me. Can't even believe I made it through that. But that was the most intense time I can think I can remember. Somebody in here from Australia too was saying they wish they would tell, talk about our dark parables. Who was that? I'm, Hazel. Oh, you're, Hazel's in Canada. Well, Hazel, that was my grad school parable. I thought I was going to die having my first relationship, romantic relationship, and grad school at the same time. So there it is. That's mine. We'll perhaps get into others, but uh, I can laugh about it now, but at the time I thought I was going to die. Back to Holly. <laughs> so if, if the purpose is in the mind, and the purpose can only be found now, that's helping me start to zoom. Talk about zoom room, that's really a zoom, zoom into the mind. I'm starting to realize that I can only find this purpose. If purpose is the only choice, I can only find it in this moment. And that it must be that all my thoughts about the past and the future are trying to defend against me discovering 
my purpose of forgiveness. So that means that you start to see, just like Daniela was talking about, just like others have talked about this weekend, that it's these time distractions are coming in. And of course, we have all these ego reasons for our time distractions. You know, it's not, almost like we're saying, well, I'm not going give, to give up everything for you. And Jesus is saying, come now, come now with me. Come this instant into the peace. Come rest with me. You are so worthy of the rest, so worthy of the love. And we seem to have a lot of plates spinning that involve the past and the future. It's not just the past, but we project them off into the future, and so it's a complicated scheme that the ego you know, built up to keep us really distracted from the moment. And so we have to face that maybe I'm willing to, to start to loosen from these past and future concepts. Maybe I'm just willing. Maybe that's what this whole thing has been for. Even the intensity of it is just to get this soft reminder, come back, come back to the present, come back to the now. And what I'm here to share, what Francis is sharing, what everyone in the studio, what Jeffrey and, Jeff and Greg are sharing, what Living Miracles, what all of us are sharing, what Jesus is sharing is, is that it's safe to go for this moment. Everything, without exception, will be provided to go for this moment. As Francis shared last night, the means will be given. We don't have to accept the body as an end and then put our mind through all these mental gyrations to support this body image. Successful body image. We've all been through it. If I ask anybody, everyone in the audience, you know, has anybody thought I would just be happy if I could just have a successful career, enough money to live happily on, and, and, a, and a relationship, you know? How many of us have just thought, well, I don't want much, just a little bit. Just Jesus, please just give me these three things. A, a very loving, honest, intimate relationship, a, a nice career, or at least enough money so I can have a, a, a happy life. You know, it's almost like, and, and Jesus is saying, come with me in the moment. Come, 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 come back. Come back to the present. Come back to the present. This is what I'm talking about. This is what Eckert's talking about. This is what Muji's talking about. We're all a symphony of voices saying the same thing. It's the same presence. It's the same purpose calling us into the moment. And I know, Holly, you've had those moments where you've felt this call. You've really felt this call. And that's why we're here having this conversation even, because you felt this call. And you have felt, just like I felt, this little niggling thing in the back that's like, well, yeah, that sounds pretty good, but, but practically speaking, you know, the voice of our past, the voice of our parents, the voice of our, the generations, practically speaking, it's like saying, it's the but, you know, it's like the moment sounds really attractive, but, it's the big but that comes in, and it's just this little thing in our mind that we've been so programmed to follow and listen. Um, I remember when I was growing up, I don't know when I was a teen or maybe I was a teen or in my early 20s, and I heard somebody came to me and they said, never forget to look out for number one. And I said, what does that mean? And they said, always look out for yourself because nobody else is going to look out for you. So they were basically telling me, look out for number one, and number one was the body, <laughs> was the person and that don't trust anybody else or anything else, but you're in this world to survive and, and always look out for number one first, they would say. Over the years, Jesus is like, well, yeah, you can look out for the one, <laughs> but <laughs> the one doesn't really have a number. 
There was a three dog night song. One is the loneliest number that you'll ever know. Two can be as sad as one is the loneliest number since the number one. Oh. I mean, I, and then Jesus is like re-singing the song to me. One is the only experience you'll ever have. <laughs> two, there is no two, never was, never will be. There's only one, only one. You know, see, it ended on a happy note. I, you know, it's always a retranslation. It's a retranslation. And that's why we're joined together. We're doing these online retreats. We're joining together. We're joining so deeply together because we have to have the permission, to give our mind permission to drop into that moment, to drop into that instant. We're just revving up. We're just drawing, calling forth the witnesses. We're just building up our momentum. You know, we're, we're just building it up. We're going to sing a happy song here, and we're all going to sing together. And we're, we're not going to cave into the ego's time distractions, past and future. Ain't nothing going to break in my stride. Nobody going to slow me down. Oh, no. I'm coming in to Jesus. i got to keep on moving. You know, we are not going to be stopped in our approach of the holy instant. We're going to drop, keep dropping, keep having miracles so things are being provided for us miraculously. While we still believe we have needs, we would rather have them be miraculously met than from using all of our past learning and believing we personally are running the show and driving the car. There's another friend in here, Holly, that can help us out. This... Oh, this is a great witness from Taiwan. What's the name? Zibrum. 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 Zibrum Li from Taiwan is helping us out, Holly. And and now that I'm in the singing mode, Zibrum Li writes, this is from Taiwan, who came all the way to Holland to be with us in Holland, temporarily locked herself in the bathroom, but she got out. She writes, Hi, beloved David. When I started practicing the Course, I listened to your teachings on a daily basis. One day, while I was sitting in the car, the song you sang to us, Nothing's gonna stop us now, came to mind, and I started to use your prayer to open my heart to the Holy Spirit. And what was that prayer? Please use all the symbols in my dream to teach and guide me. That's the prayer. Holy Spirit, please use all the symbols in my dream to teach and guide me. Right after this, Holy Spirit's answer was given. The song came right through on the radio in the car, singing, Let the world around us just fall apart. Maybe we can make it if we're heart to heart. It was a miraculous moment. Now I pray to refresh this prayer. Dear Holy Spirit, help me to follow your guidance moment by moment to let you reinterpret everything for me to collapse time and space in your loving presence. Amen. What a beautiful prayer. And what a beautiful miracle to have that song come on the radio as a reflection to remind you that you're in, you're coming. You're moving in the, the right direction. You're moving inward. It's the symbols of the world that are showing us and I've had that happen actually many, many times where I've just been in that one moment and then the perfect song just comes on the radio at that very moment. And it's so convincing because, as Francis was saying, we believe our mind is, is 
not connected to this vast cosmos. We don't see that the cosmos is a projection is, and is still at one with the mind. We, we see it as something vast and outside. And we need all those little miraculous synchronicities to convince us that, that we are awakening, that we are heard. And I, I remember so many parables in my life where I've, I've been in that place where I just... I just had the perfect song come in and it just, my heart just sank in, into peace and calmness. Because I said, thank you, I needed that. Right then, I needed that. Oh my gosh, it's 11, but... Nothing's going to stop me now. <laughs> because Frank, my beloved Frank, is writing in from Switzerland. And, and he's pouring his heart out here. And so we all are going to, to join in this prayer with Frank to, to join in this prayer. Because it's, it's important. Thank you, Holly, too. Thank you. There's Frank, and there's Fabian, and Helena, Helena, from Switzerland. Three beloveds in one shot, unbelievable. <laughs> Thank you. So Frank's, Frank's pouring his heart out, he's writing in. Hi David, since the last time we saw each other in Mallorca, my physical condition has deteriorated even more. The deterioration seems to be happening at a steady pace. The diagnosis is that a herpes virus got into my nerves and is chronic now. There is no cure, but just symptom relief options that really don't work that well and are very toxic for the body and affect my memory and thinking. I am at the end of my rope and am considering suicide. I am very upset and angry at everything and everybody. God, the Course, the world, and even you. I have listened to your talk on level confusion several times and I don't see how it can help me with my pain. I feel totally misunderstood. As you know, I've dealt with a lot of emotional pain in my life. Heroin addiction, loss of a child, depression, and horrible demoralization. But this seems very different now. I still get inspired moments of joy when I extend, but I always fall back into the dark hole over and over because the symptoms keep worsening, and that terrifies me. It feels like I am being tested about how much pain I can take, and that there would be an even more terrible price to pay if I end up euthanizing myself. I feel squashed into a corner with despair and rage. I could not finish reading the lesson of the day, 3.05 this morning. Such was my discouragement and anger. The message, help us to accept your gift and judge it not, sounds to me like empty words and promises. Where is the gift in such a frightening and hopeless condition? Why does God not remove my symptoms? There is a belief that I am presented with all this pain to overcome it or to learn to live with the pain or something like that and it makes me furious. I feel I cannot transcend this because I am too screwed up of a person since to fully accept burning pain seems impossible to me. That I am choosing this situation, I have a hard time to believe. I feel often 
that this condition, I really have nothing to offer. In this condition, I have nothing to offer any more when I extend, and even might just pay lip service. Thank you for considering my question. Frank. Well, there's a lot of aspects to this, Frank. There's a lot of aspects to your expression, and there's a lot of aspects of, of clarification, really, that, that we can join in. And, and I again want to remind everybody, too, that there's only one Son of God, and there's only one of us, so I want everyone to hold Frank in your prayers. And, and this means I want everyone to go and drop into the, that prayer of the mind, that power of the mind, that healing grace that extends and radiates in, in, to every aspect of the dream world. That there is a power inside of us that is so strong that we need merely just make a nod, make the slightest nudge, an opening for that power to extend and radiate through our entire perception. What, Frank, you have poured out is these are the, the fears and the doubts that, that everyone has to face on what seems to be a daily basis and for you, it seems to be the conditions just seem to be very, very extreme, but, but you have poured your heart out and you have given your prayer for all of us to join you in this prayer for healing. Because the idea, too, that, that, that you have chosen this situation um, is, is a, a very unreal belief. Even the belief that this specific situation that you're describing, you have chosen, I would say that is what we could call a wrong-minded choice. It's, it's trying to make that impossible choice, that choice to avoid love, or avoid healing, or avoid the, the grace, the blessing, that's the same choice that everyone faces when they look at these specific situations. So you're describing your situation, and, and what I have shared over the years is that this is how the ego set up the world. It sets up specific situations that have nothing to do with the whole, and the prayer has to be for the wholeness. In fact, if you knew that there was a way to join in your mind with the presence of love and wholeness that would take you and lift you up beyond this belief in this situation and, be and beyond all separate situations and beyond all thinking of situations, that is the prayer that is the healer's prayer, is to come back. We have to begin to, to start to let go of all these things. I mean, at the beginning when you were describing the condition, the diagnosis, I know from talking with you that you've been searching for some time for what you were calling like an accurate diagnosis. Because you've, you've consulted different physicians, different healers. And then when you were in Thailand and, and Laos, you know, you were over there and you were taken in and this is where this diagnosis come in. But it's like the mind has to be willing to go beyond the diagnosis. The ego will only offer you many different diagnoses many different magical thoughts for what is the cause in the body, what is the cause in the world. It's, that's all it does, is it generates causes, it generates false causes, it generates false diagnosis. 
there have been friends of mine and people that I've known where they they have gone through many, many different issues around their body and around symptoms and things, and then and then they've they've gone into a doctor and the doctor has told them, you have a terminal illness. You will be dead in so many weeks or months or years. And and they go back and they they're shocked that they've been given a death diagnosis and then there's something inside of them that rises up that just is like, this can't be the truth. This cannot be the truth. This, whatever I have considered to be my life and everything, it, it's, it can't just end in this way. And that's the beginning of the prayer of the heart where you just rise up inside and you just say, no different than, than Bill and Helen that Francis was talking about. There has to be, there has to be another way. There has to be something beyond this. And I have to have the willingness to open to that and the desire for that. Because as long as we pin our relationship with God or our relationships with our brothers and sisters, our relationships with Jesus, Jesus any of our relationships are pinned to the evidence of this world. We are pinning it to a very dark, darkened glass. What was the Batman story called? Black? Dark Knight. We are, we are pinning everything to the dark night when we buy into this belief system. It, it is a death wish. It is a dark, devious, cunning, clever, ingenious death wish, but it is nevertheless a death wish and and that's where we all are joining with Frank today. We have to we have to realize that everything we are presented with is just an opportunity for us to join in our strength, to join in the love, to join in the light. Even when these thoughts are prevalent, when these thoughts are rising up and they seem to be very strong in our awareness, we have to come back, we have to stop, we have to sink inward. I always would do this, just quiet my mind in deep prayer and ask, ask to be shown. The love, only the loving thoughts are true. Only the loving thoughts are true. And everything else is an appeal, an overwhelming appeal for healing and help. And that, if that's the one scrap, if that's the one piece that you can join with, everything else is an appeal for healing, for help. It starts to ease the mind just with that little crack. Because this is the, the crack that starts to loosen it for you, Frank, for Holly, for Sylvia, for Daniela, for everyone who's joined together in this prayer, that is the little crack that says there must be something beyond attack. Let me use this moment, let me use this tiny crack in my awareness, in my consciousness, this tiny opening, a sliver of an opening to be carried beyond the belief in attack.
because in the end it's not what seems to happen to bodies or what bodies seem to feel in the end is like it's this crazy insane belief and attack and I know for myself I when I had these intense experiences I've I've had some very, very dark experiences in my life where I felt like I was dying, I felt like I wanted to die, I felt like there was no escape, like I was stuck between a rock and a hard place and I, and I couldn't see anything else, I couldn't see a way out. that I was reminded again very softly, very gently, it was a decision, not a decision for the situation, no, it was a decision of purpose in my mind. The ego's decision of hatred, there's another way, there's another choice, And then I would be instructed, just think of, of any one, any place, any time where I shared such a moment of happiness and glee, playfulness, sparkle, shine, love, and just let my mind open to that love and remember just to walk through that crack. And remember too that that's a decision too that's available to me, always available, always present. So loving. And it really, it really touched my heart. This morning I was, you know, getting in the, the car to come over, to come to the studio, and there's like three more questions had come in, and, and I said, well, I, I'm in the car now, just read me the questions. So, Slava was reading me your question, reading me Holly's question, reading me Muna's, Muna's question as we were driving over to the studio, and it's just, yeah, it was a quiet drive of, of prayer. So I want us to end the session today by joining together in this prayer for healed perception. To join in true empathy for what is real and true. And as I was sharing with Sylvia, when that gnat comes up and it keeps flying around your face and it keeps landing on your hair, on your eyebrow, on your, on your nose, on your lips, and it's flying around, it just wants to keep, it doesn't want to go away. We have to come back and we have to be still and remember that love. Because the love is so, so deep and we are so deeply joined in this love and this prayer. And we all go home together. There is just one of us. We all go home together. No one is left behind. No thing is left behind. No seeming situation but dissolves in the presence of God's love and God's grace, the presence of Christ. So I want us all to hold this in mind. Yeah, Frank, I love you. Yeah. I'm 
so glad you're in my life and I love you. So please come back and for the movie. I don't know what the movie will be today. <laughs> but we'll pray. <laughs> we'll pray on, on the movie. Yeah. So thank you.